So now what we're going to do is go from kind of the big picture, the 200 mile view, to the interpersonal and through the lens of creative self-expression. Gary Glazner is the founding director of the Alzheimer's Poetry Project and he directs the Memory Arts Cafe in Brooklyn, New York. He is the author and editor of several books, including one that's available on the table here, Dementia Arts, Celebrating Creativity in Elder Care. He has worked in 25 states and many countries. He has trained over 4,000 health professionals and care partners and individuals with dementia in enjoying accessing poetry and using that as a way to enhance quality of life and communication. He, he is a founder of the Dementia Arts Research Ensemble, which brings artists and scientists together to think about how do we actually evaluate arts-based initiatives. Gary has been a guest artist at our Memory Cafe before, and he will be tomorrow at our Memory Cafe. And last month, I told our Memory Cafe guests that Gary is sort of a cross between Shakespeare, William Carlos Williams, and Groucho Marx. <laughs> so I don't know what Gary thinks of that. You can be the judge of that when you hear him now. I was a florist. I worked at a flower shop for 18 years, but I always wanted to do something more masculine. So I became a poet. <laughs> I'm Gary Glazner. I'm the founder and executive director of the Alzheimer's Poetry Project. And I began to do this work in 1997 in Northern California. I got a grant from a group called Poets and Writers. And no instruction on what to do, just to somehow use poetry. And I applied for the grant and uh, picked uh, an adult daycare center that was very close to the flower shop so I could drive there in my lunch hour. And no instruction, just to somehow to use poetry. I hit on the idea of using classic poems that the people might have learned as kids. The moment of inspiration for me, the story that I love to share with people, is that there was a guy in the group, his head was down, seemingly unaware of his surroundings. And I said the Longfellow poem, I shot an arrow into the air, and his eyes popped open. He said, it fell to earth, I know not where. <laughs> and suddenly he was with us and was able to participate. And it was an incredible moment for me as a person, and as a poet, to see how useful poetry could be with this community. So at the same time, my mom, whose name is Frankie, Wait, time out, time out, time out, time out. So I was here a year ago uh, working with you guys, and I had a day off, and it was, it was an amazing day for poetry in the Boston area because it was the dedication of the Edgar Allan Poe statue. Yeah, you guys, he's a, he's, a, he's a Bostonian boy. He came back. They have a statue of him. And the same day, they were having a rededication of the Longfellow bust. And they said, hey, we're having a party at the Longfellow house. Do you, you want to go? And so I went. And then they said, do you want to meet Longfellow's great-granddaughter? And I was like, oh, this is amazing. And I met her. And I got to share the story with her about it, using Longfellow's poetry. And then she said her name, Frankie. And I, I couldn't believe it. I, it's, that's my mom's name. And we had this great, great experience. Time in. <laughs> so at the same time that I was doing this work in Northern California, my mom had cancer. And the cancer had spread to her brain. So she had tumors. And she was on morphine. So she was having issues of memory and cognitive ability. And one day my dad called and he said, your mom is really, really upset. She's really agitated. She's asking for cherry ice cream. Could you get some cherry ice cream and come and help? I get a little verklempt at this part. My dad is one of these guys 
that never asked for help. So I, I knew it was bad. So I went and got the ice cream. And I remember this moment so strongly. I reached back to get the ice cream out of the car. And I had all the books with me from the workshop. And I just thought, I'm going to bring the books in and try them with my mom. And so I brought them in. And she started to eat the ice cream and calm down. And my dad's name is Billy. My mom and dad were childhood sweethearts. They became boyfriend and girlfriend at age five and six. We're from Oklahoma. <laughs> now, my mom, Frankie, used to tease my dad, Billy, with the little rhyme, can you bake a cherry pie, Billy boy? And that was one of the rhymes in the book. So I began to, sing, to, to say the poem, and she began to sing it and to do these little hand motions. Can you bake a cherry pie, Billy boy, Billy boy? And again, it was this moment of clarity and playfulness, this time with my own mom in hospice. She passed away about a month after that. And since that time, I've dedicated my life to working with PhDs. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share some stories with you about people I have the honor of working with. And I'm going to give you some simple techniques that you can use. I've gone around and I've got to talk to a few of the people who are here today, and I know that there may be applications in your organizations, in your personal work, in your personal lives, that hopefully you'll be able to use some of these, some of these things. All right. So I want to start, and I, I'm, um, I'm so happy that Mike is here to have that voice with us today of inclusivity. And um, I want to start with a little video of a guy named Jim that I had the honor of working with a f about uh, two, two, three years ago in uh, Washington, D.C. And he participated in what we call a memory arts cafe. And in this case, we created a song today, uh, that day. And you're going to hear what Jim has to say about that experience. My name is Jim Eastep. I'm a person with Alzheimer's, and we attended the session this evening where we did sort of an interactive uh, development of a song, and uh, it was very engaging, and it brought us out of our shells. I think it brought both those caregivers who are, quote, normal, and those of us with the disease to um, have fun. And that gets to the gist of improving the quality of life of patients with Alzheimer's. We're not just looking for a cure here. We're looking for an improved lifestyle for us. And this helped. Thank you. So I don't think there could be a more articulate statement about, um, you know, about what we're trying to do, uh, improved quality of life. Everyone wants a cure. We all want that. But what are we going to do today? So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you a few, few things that have worked in my life. So the number one technique that we use is call and response. Now, call and response is where the session leader says a line of poetry can't even be a word and has the group respond back. So would you like to try it? <laughs> it's very early in the morning. We're going to get you to be a little bit more enthusiastic. <laughs> So I'm going to ask again, and this time I want a little bit more participation. Actually speak the words, don't just inside of yourself say it. So I'm going to ask again if you would like to try it, and if you're ready. Are you ready? Yes! Would you like to try it? Yes! All right, everyone except for the, no. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to say a line of poetry, and you're going to respond back. I say it, you say it. In this case, what we're going to use is what's called the dicho or a Spanish proverb. So first Spanish and then English. Everyone ready? Yes. Oh, good. Now you got it. All right, here we go. I say it, you say it. Here we go. Pan es pan. Pan es pan. Queso es queso. Queso es queso. No hay amor. No hay amor. Si no hay un beso. Si no hay un beso. Beso, beso, beso. Beso, beso, beso. Abrazo. 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 Bread is bread. bread, is bread. Cheese, is cheese. cheese is cheese. Without a kiss, Without a kiss. There, is no love. there is no love. Kiss, kiss, kiss. kiss, kiss, kiss. 
Abrazo! All right, let's do it one more time. And this time, see if the person next to you can turn either way. You'll figure it out. See if you can hug them. They'll hug you, OK? All right, so when we get down to the end, we say abrazo, which means hugs. So see if you can get a hug or give a hug, OK? All right, here we go. Here we go. I say it, you say it. Pan es pan. Pan es pan. Queso es queso. Queso es queso. No hay amor. No hay amor. Si no hay un beso. Si no hay un beso. Beso, beso, beso. Abrazo! <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so this idea, this idea of call and response, I want to I want to go into it a little bit. Where do we find this? in our communities. Where, where have you heard call and response used? Kindergarten, Kindergarten we, teach, we use it to teach kids. In church, right? Almost all religious ceremonies have some element of call and response. Certainly the Baptist church that I grew up in, yelling out amen, uh, uh, the Catholic liturgy, uh, the most famous of all, right? Two people are standing there, the other person says, yeah, do you, repeat after me. Do you take, right? So the marriage vows. Where else? Where else do we find it? The, in, in uh, sports, right? In sports, especially um, with what's, the, what's that group that's Gary, Gary. He's our man. If he can't do it, no one can. Go, Gary! I just, I just relived a cheerleading experience. You raised your hand way back there. What were you going to say? You were going to say cheerleader. OK. How about in the military? Yeah, the marching cadence, right? All right, time out, time out. Um, I, just, I just have to share this because it just happened a couple days ago. Um, and we had Veterans Day yesterday. So my niece, Emily, my brother's uh, Kevin and Alma's uh, son, uh, daughter, um, my niece, <laughs> Emily Glazner, who I watched graduate from high school about three years ago, last week was promoted to being a sergeant in the U.S. Marine Corps. <laughs> Time in. All right. What's happening in the brain when we're doing call and response? I know that there's some doctors and researchers and nurses here, so let's talk a little bit about that. Everybody's interested in it as well, but there's some medical professionals here as well. So when we're doing that, what we're doing is not asking the person to do a weakness, which might be autobiographical memory, how we think of memory like, do you remember the time we went to the frog pond in, what's that place, Boston <laughs> Commons. Um, but you're asking them to just repeat back the words, which is a particular type of memory, a sense memory called echo or echoic memory. Now, echoic memory is four to eight seconds long. So listen to it with a line from William Shakespeare. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see. So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. It's almost exactly the same. So that's a strength. And we find even in fairly late stage dementia, people can still repeat back the words. Think about how we learn language, right? The parent holding the baby. Baby looks up, starts to track facial expressions, later starts to mimic the words. At first has a sort of, you know, a uh, cadence that has almost a gr grammatical feel to it, but is, is just uh, nonsense, and then language. So we learn language in a, in a call and response manner. So it's really, really powerful. And that's our main technique that we use. I'm going to show you one example of this. This is our first session that we did in uh, Korean in San Francisco. This was 
a few years ago. What you're going to hear is I'm going to recite a poem by William Blake, and this woman is going to respond. And then there was a social worker that I was teaching to do call and response. And so the rest of the session she did in Korean. But this you'll hear this little bit with William Blake. In the forest of the night. Tiger, tiger. Tiger, tiger. Now I want to draw your attention to something that's going on in here. And that is that as I am leading the poem, I am also primarily engaged in listening to her. And this is what I think, for me, one of the things that I get out of this work is this idea of living in the moment. And so I'm actively listening, and you'll see that she actually starts to, her eyes start to crinkle up a little bit. She gets this tiny bit of growl in her voice, and then I make it bigger, right? And then I can see, if I do the, the tiger, that she's going hit, to hit, hit the punchline home. So just let's watch that again. Just watch for that little interaction of her starting it. In the forest of the night. Tiger, tiger. Right there. Tiger, tiger. <laughs> so call and response. And I want to just do one more example of this before we move on. This was at a session in Santa Fe at a place called Santa Fe Cares. And what you're going to see is uh, this gentleman's response to the poem uh, by E.E. E. Cummings that starts off with the line, I carry your heart. It's going down, and then it comes up. The root of the roots. The root of the roots. Bud of the bud. Bud of the bud. Tree of the tree. Tree of the tree. Of a sky called life. Of a sky called life. That grows higher. That grows higher. Than mind can reach. Than mind can reach. Or soul can hope. Or soul can hope. And this is the wonder. And this is the wonder. Keeps the stars apart. That keeps, that keeps the, the stars, stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. I carry it in my heart. Yeah. <laughs> so this idea of combining movement, touch, recitation of poetry is at the essence of what we do at the Alzheimer's Poetry Project. So I want to do one more example of call and response, this one with the um, poem by the Scottish poet Robert Burns. And in this one, you can take the person's hand and move it gently to the rhythm of the poem. So see if that person next to you, you have to figure out which way you're going, but see if that person next to you will take, take their hand. Just join hands with somebody next to you. There we go. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to say a line of poetry. You repeat after me. Move the hand gently to the rhythm of the poem. Ready? So here we go. We're just moving the hand to the rhythm of the poem. Get that little groove going. All right, there we go. I say it, you say it. Here we go. Ready? My love is like a red, red rose. My love is like a red, red rose. That's newly sprung in June. That's newly sprung in June. My love is like a melody. That's sweetly played in tune. That's sweetly played in tune. Now, Robert Burns is a Scottish poet. Let's add in the Scottish accent, <laughs> or what they call the Scottish burr. Ready? Here we go. My love is like a red, red rose. My love is like a red, red rose. That's newly sprung <laughs> in, June. in June. My love is like a melody. 
That's sweetly played in tune. That's sweetly played in tune. Beautiful. Give yourselves a round of applause. So the idea of the dementia-inclusive community, of building community around, for me, around arts can be a really powerful tool to do this. Um, this is Evadine. She's a woman that I love to work with uh, at New York Memory Center, my home base in Brooklyn, an adult day center. And Evadine is very vibrant, and I always say, Evadine, prettiest smile i ever seen. <laughs> and I just wanted to share that with you. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, building community. So uh, about a month ago, I participated in an event at the Santa Fe Opera in New Mexico. And this is part of a project called Community in Residence. And so the idea is to riff off of the artist in residence who gets time outside of their normal daily activity. But in this case, we bring in people living with memory loss and their carers, and we work with different cultural organizations. Now, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, John Zeisel. So give John a round of applause. Uh, not only a supporter of this event today, but uh, early on uh, reaching out to different organizations to, to bring people into community with them. So um, Santa Fe Opera, what we did was, uh, in our, ours we have a guest artist. And so this case was a young woman who's a, a soprano, a singer, not, not from the the gangsters, the other Sopranos. <laughs> and she's a wonderful singer, and so she taught us how to warm up, how to warm up our voices, and sang an aria about love. And then we said to the people, what, we're going to create an opera. Let's create an opera together. What do you want to do it of? So they said, let's write it about love. And so then we started to say, OK, well, we need a character. So we had Black Bart. And this is Black Bart, our friend Sky. Uh, very, at this point, uh, very difficult to verbalize, but still an incredible dancer. You can see he has his pirate hat on. He has his love interest, uh, uh, Victoria, dancing with him. And then you can see the genie here who played an instrumental part after Sky killed the bard, which was me, the narrator. Uh, because at opera, you have to have a death, right? <laughs> so then the... the Jeannie brought me back to life. So it was an amazing event. You can't see it, but if you could see just beyond the railing and the, and the uh, trees there is the Sangrio del Cristo, Cristo Mountains, uh, the just gorgeous mountains. It was an outdoor space at the Santa Fe Opera. So really fun, and we had food and all kinds of stuff, and just uh, made an amazing, um, uh, you know, in an hour created and performed this opera. My favorite part was, uh, like, every so often I would just... I'd give the cue to the opera singer, and she'd have to, you know. <laughs> so in Brooklyn, what I do is a little riff on this. As we said, John and Susan so eloquently said, one size doesn't fit all. So I'm mostly interested in the arts. So what I call it is the Memory Arts Cafe. And our little wrinkle is each session has uh, a guest artist. So we have some refreshments. They get to meet the artist. Um, I interview them so we get to find out you know, why they became a dancer, or why they became a drummer, whatever it, whatever it is. And then we always create something together. Everybody, we create some kind of performance together. And so in this case, this was at our culminating event a couple years ago at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And we had uh, Jesse, uh, the trumpet player, and we had a dance group. And you can see one of the participants dancing. There's a shot of the audience. We had over 100 people come. And then there's a, a mother and daughter who are looking at one of the sculptures. They, they have decommissioned art, so we actually could touch the art. And so we, th that, that little sculpture became part of the performance that we created, that story of that little sculpture. And this was uh, one of my favorite experiences because my favorite uh, painter is Vincent van Gogh. Uh, time out. Yesterday, I did go to the... Uh, uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts and got to see the Vermeer, so the two Vermeers. So if anybody has a chance to do that, you should, you should get a chance to see it. Time in. And um, <laughs> so how do we include 
If we're working in a museum setting, I'll give you just a little brief example of how we include, how do we get into the art through poetry. So Van Gogh, a prolific letter writer, uh, what was his brother's name? Theo, right? So I found out about Van Gogh, that he loved poetry. And when he liked a poem, he would copy it out. And when he got enough of them, he would take the pages and sew them together in a little book and then send it to Theo. And in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, uh, his letters are searchable. So you can put in a term and find out what Van Gogh thought about red. And in my case, I put in poetry. And that led me to this uh, entry, which is a paraphrase, but Vincent Van Gogh writes to his sister Wilhelmina, Dear Wilhelmina, have you been reading this new American poet, Walt Whitman? He's full of life and love and lust and just amazing images and fireballs. And then about a month later, after he wrote that letter, he painted Starry Nights. So we think that there's a chance that Whitman's poetry helped to inspire the painting. And so that's how we got into it. So we shared the letter and we did that and then we created the poem inspired by the painting. So we explored, you know, what does the painting make us feel like? And we even took our foot, we took our foot and we stepped into the painting. We stepped into the painting. And imagine what it would be like to <laughs> knock on one of the doors in the little houses. And then the best line, we're exploring the painting through our senses, the best line was, I asked this one guy, what do stars taste like? He said, stars taste like Milky Ways. <laughs> so just before we move on, you'll notice uh, how much gesticulation I was using close to the painting, which was really freaking the guards out. <laughs> These are the littlest poets that I work with. Uh, uh, New York Memory Center is on the ground floor in Brooklyn. On the second floor is Ace Preschool. They are two and a half and three years old, the youngest ones. We go in and we teach them, you know, a poem like, Ickle me, tickle me, pickle me too, something like that. <laughs> and then we go downstairs and we go meet the neighbors and we recite the poem, and now, uh, and you don't really have to do any of art, just getting the little kids and the elders together is already a success. And Ola, Ola has uh, a competition to see how many she can get on her lap. <laughs> She's up to eight. <laughs> so again, this idea of John and Susan talked about the moat that surrounds uh, skilled nursing, assisted livings, even adult daycare centers, how we get across that. In our case, we have a drawbridge that brings us down from the second floor. <laughs> but can you imagine how powerful it is to bring the kids in? And in this case, like we said, one of the uses of call and response is to teach language. And um, they are learning language for the first time. Also, many of them in their homes speak Spanish and others speak Arabic. So they're not only learning language, but they're encountering English for the first time. So this idea of the rhythm of the language is really powerful. And so again, it's just this outreach. Where's the part of the community that we can bring together to help improve that quality of life? And you can see you know, how excited they are, and they're all doing the movements and everything. So about three years ago, I did a uh, project uh, with Senator Udall from New Mexico. And he sponsored us to have an exhibit in the rotunda of the Russell Senate office building. This was an exhibit of different types of uh, arts programs that people living with memory loss had participated in. And so we had uh, images of people doing dance and music, and we had poems and art that they had created. You can see. Uh, just a little bit of the rotunda there, and those are our panels that were in between. So the, the best part was, uh, I called it Dementia Arts on Capitol Hill, which everyone just said, oh, that's just every day. <laughs> so one of the things that was really fun, um, which again, uh, you know, the inclusivity idea, right? 
And so I got to invite uh, Stuart Hall, who has uh, vascular dementia, and his, it, he was a librarian at San Francisco State for his career, but he always wanted to be a writer. And so this is one of the things, like, he's actually become an, a really prolific poet. He's written over a thousand poems, and he writes them in limericks, which is for vascular dementia is just about right, that amount of time that he can focus to write it down. And so this is one of Stewart's poems. So he was our guest, guest artist that day. So he says, my mind's not at all a blank state, though I cannot keep track of the date or the day of the week and facts play hide and seek for my mind to be blank would be great. <laughs> Instead, it's wired like spaghetti. It conflates the important and petty. The connections of things are like tangles of strings or like a celebratory spaghetti. Or confetti. <laughs> Just paying, seeing if you're paying attention. So the idea was we had the Russell, uh, the exhibit for up for a week, and so we had a panel discussion uh, that Senator Udall came and spoke at, as well as Rocco Landisman, the at that time was the head of the National Endowment for the Arts, and we brought in some experts on uh, doing arts projects and some scientists, and so. Out of that came this idea, what do we want to do next after bringing this group together and starting to work together? So we decided that we would do uh, research together. And so I created what I call the Dementia Arts Research Ensemble, which I'm really into acronyms. So this one is with apologies to Nancy Reagan. <laughs> Dare. Dare. So some of the people in it are uh, our dear friend, uh, John and Susan uh, from Wisconsin, the amazing uh, leader, thought leader in this field, uh, Dr. Ann Bastings, who's the creator of Time Slips and so many amazing projects. Uh, Kate De Medeiros from the University of Oxford in, uh, uh, University of Miami in Oxford, Ohio, who's done a lot of research on friendships. So she's a, a leading gerontologist in this field. Um, Maria Genet, who does Kairos Dance, Judith Kate Friedman, uh, Songwriting Works, and then uh, uh, Dr. D. Medeiros' colleague, Jennifer Kenny, and my dear friend from New York, uh, Daniel Kaplan, who is uh, doing amazing work with the Hartford Foundation uh, around building uh, systems. And then uh, Ahe Swinnen uh, from Maastricht University in the Netherlands, who came on a Fulbright scholarship to study the Alzheimer's Poetry Project for six months. And so she came and uh, six months just came and hung out and worked with me on a daily basis and wrote an amazing paper that came out of this project uh, which was published in Dementia Magazine, which is a very prestigious uh, peer-reviewed journal. And so um, that's a little bit of that work. And again, this idea of inclusivity of bringing the artists and the scientists together, bringing the artists and the gerontologists together so we can learn from each other. And how do we want to study this? What are the elements we want to look at? And how does it compare to doing a, a gold standard double-blind uh, uh, drug study? So what are those correlations? So we've finished our research project. We, we gathered together for uh, a, a weekend retreat. We've laid out some plans. The project is now done and will be written up. And so hopefully we'll get published um, within the next six months or so. As Dr. DiModeos explained to me, everything in academia goes much slower than you want it to. As she also said, she was flying to Brussels <laughs> that afternoon. <laughs> so just a little bit of that, um, uh, some, of the, some of the work that I'm very excited about doing. All right. So I've given you one technique, which is call and response. The second technique is to have discussions around, in my case, the poems. So we're going to build the session around a theme, and we're going to have discussions. So all of the techniques are meant to draw the person out, to be present in the room with them, to get them to participate. All of these are that way. So with um, discussions, I'll use the example of uh, my dear friend John Alderetti. Now, John was a lieutenant colonel. He spent 30 years in the Army. And when I met him, he was in his 90s. And he was one of these guys that 
He has a vice grip, you know, when you shake hands and you don't know if you're going to get your hand back or not. Now, John, if he liked a poem, he would give me thumbs up. He did not like my rap version of The Raven. <coughs> thumbs down. If it was too sappy, how do I love thee? He would start to play an imaginary violin. <laughs> this is his default position to say, in fact, that you are crazy. <laughs> so John and Rosie were sitting together. It was Valentine's Day. I was doing one of my favorite love poems, The Purple Cow. <laughs> Anybody know this poem? John, John knows it. He's worked. So, so let's, let's do it. Let's do it together, okay? All right, I'll say it. You say it. Here we go. I never saw a purple cow. I never saw a purple cow. I hope I never see one. I hope I never see one. But I can tell you anyhow. But I can tell you anyhow. I'd rather see than be one. <laughs> it sounds like Ogden Nash, but it's actually written in 1890 by a poet by the name of Gillette Burgess in San Francisco. Now, Gillette Burgess, you're probably thinking, I don't know anything about Gillette Burgess or anything by him, but we've all read something that Gillette Burgess created. Do you know on the back of the book, when there's a little, a little praise about the book and the author, what are those called? Anybody know? Blurbs. 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 Gillette Burgess invented the blurb. So we're doing the purple cow, and what's a sort of natural thing that you might ask? Can I ask you? Yes. What would you ask? We're doing the purple cow. What's a question you might be interested in that you would ask someone about, to have a discussion around the poem? Where would this purple cow be? Sure, where's the purple cow? Where, where is it? How about, how about you? What's something else? Have you ever seen one, right? You can ask them if they've ever seen one. How about the color of milk? <laughs> Do you think a purple cow has purple milk? A lot of times they'll say, well, brown cows don't have chocolate milk. <laughs> Sometimes they ask, if you ask if you've ever seen one, they'll say, only when I drink. <laughs> or isn't that a cocktail? It's an, ice cream. it's an ice cream in Germany. It's a famous chocolate. So imagine this, okay, you have a purple cow, it has purple milk, what's a juice? Something we drink in the morning often that's purple, grape juice. All right, I'm warning you, there is a terrible, terrible pun up ahead. You have a purple cow, it has purple milk, tastes like grape juice. What happens when it ages, ferments, turns into? All right, here it comes, you got a purple cow, has purple milk, tastes like grape juice, turns into wine. Is it? Cow Bernay? <laughs> All right, I was working in Wisconsin, in Baraboo, Wisconsin. I said that horrible, horrible joke, and this woman looks right at me and she goes, No, it's Mulo. <laughs> Number two, have discussions. All right. The third technique is to use props, something the person can hold, smell, touch, taste. I was so excited to hear about the sensory kits that they're developing uh, as part of the Fox Valley Memory Project. That is exciting. So this idea that we build the poems around a theme, or it could be songs around a theme, and then we have a prop that supports it. So I'm going to give you this example. This actually comes from here, from Worcester, with a guy named Mike Leo. Does anybody know the New England Dream Center? New England Dream Center is one of, I've worked in 26 states now, and Germany, Australia, Poland, and South Korea, and hands down, New England Dream Center and Mike Leo is one of the most creative programs I've ever seen. I mean, I walked in, and they were having a Latin dance party. I couldn't believe it. So this is one of Mike Leo's lessons of using props. In this case, you can see he uses bananas. So he has all these fun banana facts. You can see there's Sharpies by the bananas. He has a banana blues song he plays. And then he takes the banana and they become different objects. They become a phone, a jump rope, a car shift. 
and then they start to create their poems based on yellow or the banana or whatever they're feeling, and they write them. Now, in his case, it's a group of developmentally uh, challenged clients, uh, people, and so they're able to physically write, but they physically write on the banana, write the poems down, then everybody recites the poem. In our case, we performed them together using call and response. And then, how do they end the session? They eat the bananas. They eat the bananas. <laughs> now, one of the ones we use a lot is uh, tree poems. And uh, I've never seen a poem as lovely as a tree, the Joyce Kilmer poem. And we bring in leaves, bark, branches. What's something that you could think of? So a theme and then a prop that would support it. A dog, right? You could do dog roll. <laughs> what else? Yeah. Chestnuts. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. You could sing that and bring them in and maybe even have a way to sort of heat them up so you can get the smell. Um, a year ago, I went and participated in... Um, a project called Through the Looking Glass. This is run by Leslie Pedicky in uh, Illinois, and she trains her staff to have empathy uh, for the people who live at that skilled nursing home by having them live there. And I lived there for a week, uh, which there's a, a chapter of it in my book, uh, Dementia Arts, about that. But that was the thing I noticed the most, was the smell. Even though the food was actually pretty good, the day I got out, uh, left after a week, I remember pulling up to this barbecue place and I was like a cartoon character, you know, sort of like floating in on the barbecue smell. So sense of smell is really powerful. Um, yes? Dough. Dough would be great, right? Um, what, could you, you could bake bread, right? You could bake bread, you could stretch it. Yeah, you could... Uh, Make pizza. <laughs> I remember once when you were doing a presentation at a skilled care facility in Appleton, you were suddenly moved to go out and get a bucket of snow. Yeah. And that went to some interesting places. Yeah, I brought in a bucket of snow. When I first did this work in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, I was looking for a prop to bring in, and I didn't know, you know what I could bring in. And, um, I looked outside and I just thought, oh, I'm bringing in snow. So I filled an ice chest full of snow, I made snowballs, I started to pass it out to the people. Some of it was too cold, they didn't want to touch it. Other people started eating it right away. And then Ruth Dennis, the activities director, said, throw them at Gary. <laughs> Splat, whack, miles to go before I sleep. Another one that came out of Appleton when we, we did an in-depth three-month project uh, together was uh, Jennifer, uh, Jen Thompson that did um, fresh lemonade. This is a warm spring day. Fresh lemonade, strawberries, and a little spray bottle, a little mister, and she missed the people's cheeks, and then they sang raindrops keep falling on my head, and then ate the, lemonade, uh, late, uh, ate the strawberries and drank the lemonade. So supporting it with a prop um, is the third technique. The fourth one is to create a poem using open-ended questions around the theme. Now, this is similar, if not exactly, the same technique that they use in time slips to create stories. Uh, Judith Kate Friedman in um, Songwriting Works uses a very similar technique to draw out uh, the lyrics that she then sets to music. Um, and so this is an image of Fabu Carter. She's the past poet laureate of Madison, Wisconsin. We've been working together about five years now. Uh, she does programming for me in Wisconsin and Madison. And um, shall we try to create a poem together? Would you like to do that? Sure. All right. Yes. Okay. So, um, Beth, would you like to write down the answers? Sure. Now, you can do this part by yourself, but it is easier if you have a scribe you can work with. But, but I do often do them on my own, and you can write down, you can ask the questions and write them down. So what we're going to do is we're going to think of a theme, and then I'm going to ask a few questions. Uh, depending on the size of the group, sometimes you can get everybody to answer. Sometimes it's just a few people. 
and we'll create a short text uh, which we then will perform uh, later today. So we won't close with that, but we'll get a chance to create it now. So what shall be our theme? Food, harvest, love. Okay, so that's good. All right, so let's, we're going to delve into food first. <laughs> and Mike, can we start with you? So I, I think you, I heard your voice. All right, so um, the first question I uh, ask often is uh, just a general one. So, Mike, when you hear the word food, what comes to mind for you? Italian. Italian, okay, all right, Italian. So that's beautiful, right? Now, you can um, go into that more, start to draw out, flesh out the answers, or you can just move on. It sort of depends on your feeling. This is one of the skills that you develop in doing this. But I, I want to go in a little bit more, if that's okay. okay. All right, so I love Italian. So uh, f what's your favorite Italian dish? Chicken Parmesan, chicken Parmesan. I'm saying it again so Beth can hear it, right? I'm repeating the answers, I'm trying to use the exact language that Mike is using if I can, make the poem richer. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper, if we can, if it's okay. All right, so I, I can even imagine chicken Parmesan. Is anybody else sort of imagining it right now? All right, so let's go, we'll just go for Nicole for just a second. Nicole, have you ever had chicken Parmesan? Okay, so can you describe the taste? Just imagine, everybody can do this with her. So just imagine you taking a bite of chicken parm. Let's just do it. Mm. What's it taste like, Nicole? Describe the taste. Uh, cheesy, a little bit crispy. Um, <coughs> so cheesy, a little bit crispy. I think it's a perfect combination of different textures. A perfect combination of different textures. Let's all say that. I'll say it, you say it. Ready? Here we go. A perfect combination. No, repeat after me, repeat after me. After me, after me, after me, after me. A perfect combination of different textures. A perfect combination of different textures. So one, one last question for you, Mike, if it's okay. Sure. All right. Did you grow up eating Italian food? No. No. Okay. So you found it later in life. Yes. Do you have a favorite place? Yes. Would you like to share that with us? Absolutely. All right. It's uh, Paisano's Pizzeria on Grafton Street in Worcester. Paisano's Pizzeria in Grafton Street in Worcester. Let's give thanks to one of today's sponsors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right. And so it was, it was food. We could go more into that. Uh, this is just a sort of you know, tip of the iceberg thing here to give it examples. But there was one other. Was, was it harvest? or It was harvest, right? And how about you, Emily? How are you doing? Good. How are you doing you? all right? Yeah. Can I ask you a question, please? Sure. All right. So you'll notice I'm using my body in the room of moving closer to people. I'm not always standing above as we talk, so I'm kneeling down. Um, oftentimes when I kneel down before a woman, uh, they say, I'm not marrying you, <laughs> uh, and ask them if they ask a question. So what is, what's harvest for you? Will you hear the word harvest? Bounty. Bounty. The quicker picker-upper? <laughs> Our other sponsor. <laughs> All right, leaves. And how about for you, some colors of leaves that you really love? Fall leaves. Orange. Orange. Oh, by the way, time out, time out, time out. For years and years, people have said that there is no rhyme for orange. Last year, they came up with one. Door hinge. Time in. All right, what else? How about you, Stacy? Harvest. Pumpkins. 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 And this is going to get a little bit crazy, but um, in our poem, Anything Can Happen. 
So Stacy, in this poem, you can talk to a pumpkin. What would you say to the pumpkin? I can't wait for you to be pie. I can't wait for you to be pie. Can't wait for you to be pie. And would you help out? How does the pumpkin, again, this is a crazy way to think, but using our imaginations, the pumpkin can respond. What does the pumpkin say? Um, he doesn't want it to be midnight. Oh, he doesn't want it to be midnight. Wow, I love that. That's great. That's beautiful. And then there was, so it was food, harvest, and then love. Let's go way, way in the back. So you're texting like crazy. And... Um, <laughs> She's tweeting all of this. This is going live to Facebook. Um, but how about you next to, next to the tweeter? Um, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. How about for you? You hear the word love. What comes to mind for you? Amore. 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 Stick your hand in a crack and it doesn't come back. That's amore. Thank you. Thank you. You saved me. All right. Amore. Amore. And how about for you? Can I ask you? Sure. Will you hear the word love? What comes to mind for you? Big heart. Big heart. Big heart. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And if you could say someone in your life that you feel love for, mm -hmm. who, what do you say to them? Fabulous. Fabulous. Fabulous and big and Let's hug. Fabulous, big, let's hug. And what do they say back to you? Let's do it now. <laughs> let's do it now. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So I think we got our poem. You can, of course, go longer. You can go into depth. So later on, we'll get a chance to perform this poem using the con response technique. All right. So that's our four techniques. Call and response, having discussions, using props, something a person can hold, smell, touch, taste, and creating something together by asking opening questions around the theme. I want to show you a collaboration. This was one of our guest artists uh, at our Memory Arts Cafe. This is a fellow by the name of Kazu Kamaguchi. He is on a fellowship from Japan to study tap dance in New York City. And I'm going to show you a clip. It's about a minute long. I want you to watch about two-thirds of the way in Watch for this move that Kazu does. Now you're going to hear me reciting a poem by William Wordsworth, and you're going to hear a second strong voice that's doing the call and response with me. That second strong voice is a woman uh, named Linda that has a traumatic brain injury. And she often comes and uh, she's working with the New York Memory Center. She thinks that the poetry is one of the strongest things that she's doing that really helps her. So you'll hear her voice as well. And then my heart with pleasure fills. Dances with the daffodils. And dances with the daffodils. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And then my heart with pleasure fills. That's Ola. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And dances with the daffodils. And dances with the daffodils. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And dances with the daffodils. And dances with the daffodils. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And then my heart with pleasure fills. 
Dances with the daffodils. Dances with the daffodils. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And then my heart with pleasure fills. And dances with the buffalo bills. And dances with the buffalo bills. Give yourselves a round of applause. So we started, really started today with Mike coming to give his experience. Uh, we heard from my friend Jim. So I want to look Jim in the eye, Mike in the eye, my dear friend Richard Taylor who passed away uh, recently, and say we're doing everything we can to improve the quality of life today. I have uh, just a couple minutes, and I wanted to share one more story with you. I was in uh, Georgia a couple years ago, and I was reciting The Tiger by William Blake. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. And I reached out my hand to see if this woman would take it, if I could move her hand to the rhythm of the poem. And she looked up at me, and she says, Does the monkey want a peanut? <laughs> Now I'm a poet dancing around, pretty much want a peanut. And she kept getting louder and louder and louder until she finally just screamed, somebody get that gosh darn monkey a peanut. <laughs> and the nurses started laughing and I started laughing and I thought maybe it should be called the Alzheimer's Heckler Project. <laughs> I want to close with a poem I've written in the voices of some of the people I've had the honor of working with. It's called We Are Forget. We are the words we have forgotten. We are shifting and pacing. We wrote this poem. It's a pretty poem. Can you bake a cherry pie? Nevermore, nevermore. We have no horizon. We don't recall washing or eating or what you just said. Ask me my name. I have children. You are my daughter. Light washing over us, moment, moment. We have no horizon. We don't recall washing or eating or what you just said. Brush my hair. Give me a kiss. Put me to bed clean. Our handwriting is beautiful. Twists and loops of letters. We can't remember our hands. We speak every language. We can't remember our mouths. We are the past. We are porous. We are forget. Thank you.